and I'll, I'll, I want to try and quote again here because this section is quite good. In Bummerland, it seems as if every little comment either turns into a contest for total personal invalidation and destruction, or else everyone has to get all nicey nicey and fake. I like this dude. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> You know what? I think I'm just going to jump right into things this episode. And the way I want to start out is by saying that I think about six months ago now was the last time we did an episode on social media. And the way I started that one was saying that it isn't about being on social media or off of it. You have to find some kind of middle ground that's good for you. And well, I think that's generally a good rule in life. When it comes to social media, and we'll get even more specific than that, actually, during this episode. Mm. Bad opinion? Nope. I I disagree (laughs) with that now. That's some hard evolution. Yeah, it is uh, not, not very not good. To clarify for the viewers, this is in relation to, we've we've both had had pretty love-hate relationships with lots of social medias, like YouTube, Instagram. And this is also to do with, we both watched The Social Dilemma, which is, basically just a really big exposing social medias not in the oh exposing them but sort of way like not like some shit the ceo did or something but going more in depth to how they work how their algorithms work to try to get your attention get you have to have maximum engagement as well as how the human brain can react to the something that's constantly evolving to buy for your attention and how it's shaping the social world around. And for anyone who hasn't watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, I would definitely highly recommend it because on top of all the stuff that Evan just said, it's also based on interviews or it contains interviews with people who got pretty high up in a lot of the big social media companies. There were like some, some a lot of executive officers yeah, exactly. Like the person who was the president of Pinterest, the person who I think co-made the like button at Facebook. Yeah, that well, that guy was crazy. He made a lot of stuff. Was someone in ch- in charge of like Google Drive? Google Drive seems pretty harmless, still, to be honest. <laughs> Coming away from that, I'm like, I'm okay with Google Drive. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that Google Drive something that is bad, at least right now. Who knows? Maybe they'll start putting ads Oof. on it. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to need a subscription to get the ads out of your Google Drive. Don't even put the idea out there. (laughs) But yeah, there was some really, I'll say, influential people from the social media world, people who I don't think work in the space anymore. I don't think so. I think almost all of them were quite negative in their uh, attitude towards social media's slash online platforms that are engagement time based. So I, I can't imagine that they would still be in it <laughs> after basically roasting that platform. Probably not. Like they joined it fairly early on in the companies or they at some point managed to get high up, but I don't think they're in it anymore, mostly because of the ethical problems they have. So yeah, that's where a lot of this is coming from. And then I also went ahead and read one of the books that they talked about in the show because they interviewed the guy who wrote it. And his book is called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. And I have to say, he's got some rather convincing arguments. Side note, he seems like a really interesting dude from the interviews they did with him. Yeah, yeah, he does. I I definitely recommend the book as well if people are interested after watching the movie. Because he goes, say, more in-depth into a lot of the issues that the film talks about. But I figure a good way to start things off today might be to just go through those 10 arguments. I think that's a good way as well. Yeah, list them out a bit, discuss them a bit. So let's just jump into it. The first argument that he mentions is you are losing your free will. A sort of takeaway from that whole movie, stuff like that was said a lot in sort of broad terms that I feel like can sound pretty tinfoil hatty, but has some very good and convincing points. But uh, yeah, just a, a note. There's definitely something to that. and. I think I want to explain a little bit more getting into argument two, which is that quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times. Okay, very interesting both. But yeah, let's go through let's go through them uh, one at a time. The reason that it is the most finely targeted thing that you can do to get out of 
like all the batshit craziness that is happening in 2020 and the world today is that the main problem is really with the business model of a few of these companies. And Jaren, for the sake of being ultra specific in his book, comes up with a slightly silly sounding acronym. It works at least for explaining it, which is, he calls them uh, bummer companies. Oh yeah, you talked about that, yeah. Which stands for behaviors of users modified and made into an empire for rent. So to get into that a little bit more, I want to give the explanation that I heard in the near the beginning of the film, which was when I realized that this was going to be a really good movie, was when they started talking about how people are always saying that the social media companies are selling your data. That's what they're doing, right? They're collecting all the data and they're selling it. Well, there, there's that whole Facebook court case. That is true. Yeah, they do. They did give away some data there. But generally speaking, that's not what they're actually doing. I don't think they sold the data, didn't they? I don't think so. I think, I don't, I don't, did they lose or win? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. But I believe what happened there was that one of the options that used to be a feature in Facebook was that whenever you were signing up for a new app, you always give it like the list of permissions, right? Of what they're able to access from your account. And one of the things that Facebook used to do is allow you to give a third-party application access to your friends' information. Wow. So then a few people signed up for this. I forget what app it was, but the Cambridge Analytica was able to get access to it. And then they all they got access to all of their friends, and it just multiplied the effect. But that's not what the point is about. No, that's, that's not them making money. What they are making money off of, or what they are actually doing as a business, is subtly changing the behavior and opinions of its users. That is the business model of both Facebook and Google. Is change the opinion. Yeah, exactly. That is that is what they are selling to the advertisers on their site. It is changes in what you do day to day or what you think day to day. And the reason that they need so much data is that they're not just selling these changes or the potential for these changes they're selling near certainty that these changes will happen and the ways that they do that is through amassing massive amounts of data and essentially just getting to know you better than you know yourself in many ways there's all those stories of um a man signed into his daughter's amazon and no he signed into her google and some a bunch of ads kept coming up for like baby stuff and uh, like like diapers and stuff. And so he's like, what the hell's going on? And then he found out later, maybe even she found out later that she was pregnant just because she was Googling all these things like sick in the morning, like what does this mean? Didn't get period, like stuff like that. <laughs> so Google just put that into the algorithm. So it, it knew, new quotation mark, like it fit the algorithm of pregnancy. So it's like, oh, there we go. Google would definitely be able to figure that out. I'd never heard that story, but that definitely sounds plausible because I heard basically that same story, except with, I think it was Target, possibly Walmart, but I can't go with Target. Yeah, that just based off of the girl's shopping history, they started sending her coupons and whatnot for uh, baby equipment. And her dad got pissed off and like stormed in and demanded like answers or an apology. And then, like, called back a week later to apologize when he found out. She was indeed pregnant? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so even just based off of someone's, like, shopping history, like, just what the target would know, you can figure that out. It's a pretty clear algorithm, I guess. Just consistently every month buy, like, tampons or pads or something, and then a pregnancy test, and then stop buying pads. (laughs) Boom. That's true, yeah. But I think there's a lot of that kind of thing going on it's just taking yeah. people that generally look like you or in your vague demographics or act like you and seeing what people start buying or where the trends start going and then start directing you that way as well that's kind of the idea and it's just a b testing that and so that's that's the whole point basically of why reason one why you should uh meet your social media because they know you super well, so they will do what? The companies have three main goals, right, that they want to achieve, which is 
more engagement, so more time on the platform, more growth, which is total number of people on the platform, and more advertisements, which is, of course, more ads being sold or clicked on. And they are just A-B testing to try and figure out how to maximize all of that. And that often does not end up being good for people or society as a whole. Yeah, because the end game there is just people spending more and more time on their phone, which I think most people would agree. There's there's definitely a a healthy limit (laughs) to how much time you spend on your phone, how much time you spend doing anything. I want to get more specific even than that, because I was glancing through the book again the other day, and one of the things he actually specifically says was that the problem isn't that people are spending so much time on their phones. That's Mm -hmm. that can be definitely bad, but it's not really the problem. And like the problem, I think, is coming back to the idea of bummer is behaviors of users modified and made into an empire for rent. So that second part of the statement made into an empire for rent is basically that all these behavior modification things, that's just something that anyone is able to pay to use. And the whole business is that people can pay to have you see whatever they want you to see. And the way that generally works out is that the ads that get the most engagement and clicks and whatnot are often very negative ones, very scary ones, all that kind of stuff. And those ones will get a much better bang for a buck and spread organically as well throughout the platforms. And that kind of content is terrible and really the issue. That's very interesting. Okay, point one checks out. Yeah, I I would definitely agree that there are issues with people spending so much time on their phones, but I don't think that's the society-destroying part of the issue. No. If it was just spending time on your phone, then it would would just be a different medium that everyone's living in. They'd still be sort of expressing the same ideas and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And bringing it back to the second one, that quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times. When he's saying quitting social media, it is specifically those companies that have this business model of modifying people's behavior based on whatever some advertiser wants them to do. The whole of the internet or the whole of phones or whatnot isn't actually bad. That in and of itself is not the issue. And that's why Jaren and a lot of the other people in the film seem to be so hopeful, I think, is that the fundamentals of the platform, of the internet, aren't bad. Being able to communicate with people is inherently pretty good. It's just this terrible business model layer that's been put on top that is so awful. When I'm saying advertising, that's even doesn't feel quite right either because it's not even it's not the same as regular advertising or more old school advertising. Yeah. Where you're like, okay, we know generally what people who read this newspaper are like, so we're going to put an ad for, I don't know, women in this demographic in the newspaper, try to target them that way. And then the same ad goes out to a bunch of different people. This is tailoring like individual things for people, for individual people. The one that he himself, I believe in the movie talked about was he was saying like, this like sort of create group inorganically. For, For example, let's say music group. Like, oh, I can see this person um, listens to a lot of Beatles music. And people who listen to Beatles often like, uh, let's say, Father John Misty. And so then it starts recommending Father John Misty. All of a sudden, you've entered into a different sort of fan group than you were before. And you think it's because you discovered the music. And it is, I guess. Obviously. These musicians are all fine. This is an example I'm making up. But uh, if instead of musicians, it was like just different groups that you could become a part of, like let's say politically or socially or something like that, then you've just sort of, you think you've discovered something and you have, but it's creating tribalism. Yes, definitely. And I am going to take that to transition us into point number four. Because that that goes right there, which is that social media is undermining truth. Okay. So just truth as a concept is a lot less possible with these social platforms. And there are a number of reasons for that. 
but just jumping off of what you said and you were getting kind of vague into what other kinds of groups people could join, I would go into conspiracy series there. Um, that That's definitely the big one. Like people could join conspiracy theor- theoretical groups. <laughs> sure, yeah. Groups that believe in conspiracy theories. Yeah, and that in particular is actually a really powerful technique on the part of the social media platforms because people who believe in one social who believe in one social media people who believe in one conspiracy theory are significantly more likely to believe in another no matter what the conspiracy theory is they're completely unrelated yeah exactly so once you know that someone's hooked on one of them or someone's starting to believe one of them or engage in content with one you can start pushing them into the others and that what that's what the platforms do and in the movie, they specifically talked about Pizzagate, which I hadn't really heard of. <laughs> I'd heard about it from like 4chan stuff, but yeah. But that's just insane that people just all of a sudden, without ever searching for the term Pizzagate, they just started getting content about it just because the platforms thought that they would engage more with it. That, that's the sort of thing. It's like all these diverse individual users had some common interest in conspiracies, that sort of that sort of thing. So it was like, what if we just funnel them all into this one suggested search or suggested YouTube video or something like that? And then you've suddenly created a group all by yourself. Yeah, exactly. And to give people the context for anyone else who did not know what was going on, apparently the, the conspiracy theory was that there were pizza restaurants were... Doing human trafficking. Yeah, they were trafficking children in the basement and a guy actually ended up going to a pizza shop with a gun and demanding i think to see the basement he demanded and they didn't have a basement how did that start i need to read about more about that because like where on earth did that come from when why pizza going more into this idea of how this can happen to people the idea of what is true is something that's a lot harder to actually get right with the social media platforms and i think that's in large part because the quality of an argument doesn't always matter as much as the quantity of an argument in terms of its actual like persuasiveness if you hear something over and over and over again you're gonna start to believe it no matter like how i'll say silly it is or how reasonable or or senseful the opposite argument is if you just hear something over and over and over again you just eventually start to become swayed by it it's i think it's that um forget the exact term for it but uh some kind of familiarity bias it's the psychological thing where the more you're exposed to something the better you think about it you become comfortable with it yeah exactly you become more comfortable to the idea you just get used to it and you start to accept it as i don't know part of life as a clarification none of that is new like that's sort of always been how humans work for the most part, obviously, it, it depends a lot on the context. Like, you can hear stuff a lot that you disagree with. But, like, you know, people are formed a lot by where they come from, the ideas that are prevalent, when they're growing up, or where they live, and stuff like that. The thing is that it's just becoming more and more monopolized, because instead of everybody coming, like, only having access to the information from, like, their immediate sort of surroundings, People now have are linked over the all over the entire world. Just a, just a clarification: it isn't it isn't anything new that false ideas are believed or anything like that. But it is new that you can convince many people across the globe. Yeah, this was something that I was thinking about before. It is a a quantitative difference, but I think at a certain port, point, a quantitative difference can become a qualitative one. How so? It's just taking it to a new level with like the network effects and like the whole like scale and scope of it and like with the speed that misinformation spreads on the platforms leave it like fake stories spread about six times faster or more frequently than actual stories or actual information Hmm. on the platforms so it's just like you can't keep up with it just goes too fast to be able to handle very interesting i think i think something that also comes from it is um this uh, this is an example of myself that i was doing 25 minutes ago 
<laughs> I was drinking a beer and I saw that the expiry date was three years ago. So I went on a Googling free searching if expired beer could be bad or poison you or anything like that. I didn't want to die. But specifically Google has so much power in what people think because of what I found on Google, which isn't the same for everybody. People in different places, people with different search histories and stuff. What if you Google will bring up different responses? Because uh, what I found on Google said expired beer will not kill you. I wasn't that worried. But if I'd found out, even if it was just a bunch of blogs and stuff saying, oh, expired beer made me really sick, stuff like that, then I would have been way more worried. It would have altered my behavior in the real life. So I think, yeah, a lot of it is treating what you find on Google as absolute fact or like whether you know it or not, having it shape your opinion in real life and your behavior in real life. Yeah. And the power really is in that you don't notice it changing your behavior, your opinions. It's it's changes that are so subtle that you don't notice it. And to be clear, the idea that the platforms are actually changing people's behavior in the real world or it's a pretty solid fact. I think at this point, Facebook has bragged about that before. I think in the last, the midterm elections, the 2018 US ones, they were able to increase voter turnout across the board just by tweaking their algorithms for certain people. Hmm. So it can be used for good too. It definitely can, but those exact same tools are available to anyone who is wants to pay for them and have almost definitely been used to do the exact opposite, be it suppress voters or spread misinformation, just planting ideas in people's heads. And so a lot of hatred in people, that's, that's a lot of, I think, what Facebook is in shit with right now. So and just to, to recap, which, what was the title of this point we're on right now? Uh, social media is undermining truth. Uh, okay. Yeah. And the unfortunate one thing about this argument at this point is that deleting social media doesn't actually totally fix it for yourself because it's seeping into everything else. I mean, I have a proposed solution that maybe we'll get to. Oh, as, as well with the how it doesn't solve everything. It might solve a lot of your personal like anxieties and artificial prejudices or something like that that you, you've gained or, or worries that you have from a lot of social medias. But if everybody in your country <laughs> still still subscribes, then there's only so much that one person can do. Yeah, I think it's definitely would still help in that it wouldn't you wouldn't develop any more of them, or at least no more than you otherwise would just going about your life because the algorithms don't have access to you anymore. They're not showing you all the things. As, as well, this is just into a moral discussion. I think if you believe something's right, as in you believe you shouldn't be a part of using uh, social medias, only specifically ones that apply this bummer model, then you should do it pretty much no matter what, no matter what people around you are doing. Yeah. If you think it's right, you should do it. Sort of point blank. Hot take. Mm -hmm. So point number four. One, two, and four. Check out. What's number three? Uh, number three is that social media is making you into an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you too. Yeah, he's really talking from a personal perspective here, but I think it applies to a lot of people that he noticed a lot of time uh, on certain platforms or in certain areas of internet or different social media platforms. He would just get angry and want to tear people down kind of thing. I think you anybody can see that if they go in like YouTube comment sections or something like that. Like those people who are they're anonymous arguing with somebody else anonymous over like an anime and they type out like a ten paragraph essay just cause that's a pretty asshole move. And also no one cares. But yeah, this one is basically just if you noticed yourself being an asshole, don't go there. Or if you notice yourself getting angry or anxious or whatnot on a platform you sh probably shouldn't be going to it that's a solid point you want to be in the places or situations where you're uh, kind or a nice person does he have data for this social media is making you into an asshole oh he's getting into the kind of solitary versus pack which is the idea that people behave differently when they're part of a group or as opposed to when they're a single person absolutely oh my goodness i agree with that so much 
a person is smart and compassionate, people are dumb and uncaring. Yeah, that is exactly it. And when you're on social media, generally, you fall into the groups kind of category. Yeah. Because you're always fighting or acting on behalf of whatever organization or whatever group you consider yourself to be a part of. Fandom, political orientation, religious group, <laughs> uh, you know, subscriber, Redditor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just so easy then to get a little bit of points or whatever, uh, like virtue signaling kind of points by just trying to like tear down someone who disagrees with your group, basically, because it just it makes you feel like you're more accepted or you think. It'll make you feel like you're more accepted, even though it really doesn't. And back again to what I was saying before, all these points have always been true for like just people and groups of people in general. But it's just sort of on a global scale that having obviously the more people, the more impact that it's having. So that's sort of where you, how you were saying, like it's becoming so big that it's almost becoming a new animal. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely on a whole different scale. And the fact that people can just pay to make it happen, essentially, is really the issue. Like Another thing that they went through in the movie was the idea of people being scared of when automation or technology is going to overcome all of humanity's strengths, uh, everything we're good at, and just replace us in our jobs and whatnot. And we're not there yet, though, I mean, some things are getting replaced. But what they were more concerned about or what social media is a lot more concerned about or using is the fact that social media has surpassed our weaknesses, that all of our anxieties and fears, it has figured out how to use those against us. And I think the term for that is growth hacking, which is essentially hacking the human psychology to try and get people to do more, basically engage more, click on ads more. So it's actually a field of study to hack human minds i mean fear and anxiety are very powerful motivators usually all right so i actually i found a good section of the book that talks more about this pack versus single person thing by talking about the differences between facebook and linkedin okay and linkedin is in lanier's uh, opinion a pretty good example of a social media it's definitely not perfect but like it is not a bummer yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of an asterisk there. It's There are five big tech companies in the world, right? To list them off, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. And all of them deal in bummer at least a little bit. Some of them more, some of them less. So three of them will just dabble in it a little bit, but their entire business model isn't based off of it. The other two, they do entirely run their business off of it. So that's Facebook and Google. Uh, their entire company is based on this idea of changing people's behavior. And LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. So to give you a picture of the difference here, I actually got the revenue breakdown for a couple of the companies. Mm -hmm. So Facebook, the revenue is 98% advertising and 2% other. Yeah. So that's how they break it down. Twitter is 82% advertising and 18% data licensing and other. So Twitter is actually selling you data. But so can I get that again? Twitter is 82% advertising and then 18% data licensing. Oh, wow. Good thing I don't have Twitter. Yeah, I know, right? And then LinkedIn is, I think, 18% advertising. And then mm. the majority of it, 65%, is recruitment services. So it's people or uh, HR manager type people paying to try and find the best candidates for the jobs. I didn't know they did that. Yeah, no, they LinkedIn, their main revenue is that. And the next one after advertising is, I think, premium subscriptions for individual users. So the idea is that you can just have a LinkedIn account for free and post on it and whatever. But if you start to pay, you get access to extra powers or abilities which is good for people who are seeking jobs or trying to find things like that you could message anyone on the site. Or I think uh, as an individual user, you can see anyone who looks at your profile and a couple of other things like that. Tools that are extremely useful when you're trying to get a job and you want people and you want to see who's interested in you. 
and I don't I don't actually know the exact things that the HR managers would get access to because well I've never tried it but it's exactly the same sort of thing it's just extra tools to try and find uh, candidates because LinkedIn is I think at its core still a way to get candidates for jobs well LinkedIn is definitely like it's a corporate thing like I don't know anybody who's like hey you ever get LinkedIn it's so fun there's so many good memes on it like but it which kind of deals with them um, well, I feel like one of the points from the movie which is that social media should be a tool and not a life consuming thing mm-hmm. <laughs> which LinkedIn is sort of subscribing more to that if not perfectly than the other ones uh, that it's a tool you can use it to connect with people about job get a job be a, a corporate real business person business person <laughs> do so many businessy things on it but uh it's it's not just like it doesn't seem like anybody's addicted to linkedin but that guy in the movie said he was addicted to email so you know <laughs> i mean it's definitely possible but the idea with LinkedIn is the fact that there's actually something real going on there. It's not just like trying to grandstand or like prove points or whatever. You actually have something to accomplish. Or or just get, get a quick, with stuff like uh, other things like YouTube or something like that, just get a quick, you know, ooh, this is interesting. Ooh, this is interesting. Ooh, this is interesting. And you think, oh, I'll be satisfied. It's not just, just to hook the users, it's to actually do things. Yeah, exactly. There's that concrete base. And yeah, like uh, Jer and Sang here, careers are physical, real processes that generate sustenance. I mean, you need money to not starve to death. So so there's actually like a point there. And if you kind of stray from that point, people will actually call you out. He linked to an article with an interview of one of the editors at LinkedIn that said a couple of interesting things like that. When people start talking about politics, you see this flood of comments beneath what they're writing saying, this isn't Facebook. Please don't put that here. This is LinkedIn. Please talk about business. <laughs> okay, very good. And also reminds me of 4chan. Whenever anybody says anything, even vaguely Reddit related or voices an opinion that might be similar to the majority one on Reddit, people are like, F- off and go back to Reddit. <laughs> that is funny. Same sort of idea. Same idea. But yeah, on LinkedIn, it, that it's real, right? Your boss is there, your coworkers are there, your future potential bosses are there, and they're going to see everything that you're saying. So you don't have anywhere near the same incentive to do the same shit. Whereas, and I'll, I'll, I want to try and quote again here, because this section's quite good. In Bummerland, it seems as if every little comment either turns into a contest for total personal invalidation and destruction, or else everyone has to get all nicey-nicey and fake. I like this dude. Yeah, I know, right? Great. Uh, wow. This point, what it's said to me, YouTube uh, Premium, the paid account, yeah, is a good thing. Ooh, yes, actually. Now that you mention it, yes, 100%. That's actually one of the things that Jaren says. He doesn't mention YouTube Red specifically. But what he does say is that he is not going to get a social media account until he's able to pay for it. Hmm. That is his condition for doing it. So yeah, YouTube Red would be good. Yeah, not going to do it. Actually, don't, don't hold me to that. I might do it. I probably won't. I'm not going to do it now. <laughs> I'd probably still get that extension that removes the recommended feed because that feels a little bummery. But uh, yes, and I imagine it so is. I, I guess no one's paying to get their stuff put there, I think. But a lot of trash still. Well, up. ooh, I wouldn't bet on that. Because YouTube is still a subset of Google. So Google's bummer. Oh, yeah, 100%. Uh, YouTube is bummer. I'm just wondering if the recommended feed in general. It's, it's, I think it's still overall trash, but I don't, I don't think you can specifically pay to get videos there. Indirectly, you can definitely pay money to get there. but Like you can pay for views. Like... But yeah, YouTube premium. Yeah, it's YouTube premium, right? And maybe blocking one of the or two features. Maybe autoplay as well. I'm kind of torn on that one. That seems autoplay is just annoying. Yeah, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> like I, that's just why I don't. I mean, I don't. I haven't used YouTube in a while because I deleted it, but it was just really annoying. So I turned it off because usually the number one recommended right after the video you watch isn't even the one you want to watch. So I'm like, I don't want this. Oh, weird. I I always or I often found myself 
going to it. Or if not the autoplay one, one of the recommended ones. Often it would be one of the recommended, but the autoplay one was almost never it. But yeah, no. Things like YouTube Red are are a perfect thing. He even says that even for a Google search, you should probably, or ideally, would have to pay. Like have some kind of subscription hmm. to be able to use it. Obviously, there are exceptions for people who can't afford it. But that's that's the interesting part. There's a lot of people who would say that sort of the best part about these social medias or Google or stuff like that is that anybody can use them provided you have access to a computer, which you can get in public libraries and stuff like that. And then it's free so that it's not restricting access to information. But the thing is, with Google, is subscribing to the idea that Google is 100% true, 100% fact. Anything you find on Google is true information. But that is that is a sticky point. Yeah. He gets actually into the fact that they are free and how that happened a fair bit. I haven't wrapped my head around all of it, but it essentially came from when the internet was first starting with uh, all the hippies and whatnot. There was the real thought that everything has to be free or that software has to be free and given like away completely freely. Otherwise, it's just evil corporate interests or whatnot. So one of the fundamental points when these companies were starting was that the service would have to be free. And what they ended up doing, and they actually had the guy who made the decision for Facebook of what monetizing model to go for in the movie. He said that the obvious idea was advertising. If people aren't going to pay, we need to get someone else to pay. So we'll just get the advertisers to do that. But then they end up bummering. Here's a, a temporary slash potential solution that I was just thinking of. You know, you know how like to get access to these things, you need to have at least enough money to buy a computer. And if you don't, you will usually use one in like a public library, something like that. So you could make Google a paid service. And then if you go to the library, they could just be the ones to pay for it because they already pay for the computers. That's actually fair. Yeah, do something for the library. No, that's a good idea. Or public things like that. Yeah, any kind of public service. Bring the internet cafes back. Mm-hmm. And just have the companies make deals with municipalities. That's interesting, yeah. But then you're going to get into the way that Google's going to topple government. <laughs> I mean, Facebook is already toppling governments. I'm sure Google is as well. <laughs> um, What was it, uh, the example they talked about? It's Myanmar. Was it, yeah, was it Facebook? Or Google. It was Facebook. Facebook. Widespread lynchings of Burmese Muslims that actually caused like hundreds of thousands of people to flee their own country, flee, like have to leave as refugees. And that was all enabled by Facebook's advertising models. That's crazy. It is. Yeah. So let's go through the, the, the four points we've covered so far. So, so far we've done you're losing your free will. Quitting social media is the most finely targeted way to resist the insanity of our times. Social media is making it into an asshole, and social media is undermining truth. Okay, very interesting. Let's move on to number five. All right, so number five is that social media is making what you say meaningless. So what I first think of when I hear that is sort of just my general attitude towards lots of internet-based things as well, is that with so much information entering our brain, so quickly, uh, we pay much less attention and much less thought to each point. And in fact, like if we were to take things slower and <laughs> be specific and like generally slower in what we intake into our brains, we would actually get more out of each thing. I think that's close to what he was saying and probably in part what it is. What he was going at more specifically was that when you see a post say on twitter or on facebook you don't get any of the context for that post all you see is that those like 280 characters you don't see anything surrounding it and actually what you see surrounding it is entirely different content that's also been taken out of context and kind of arranged into your own personal little feed so you don't get any of the actual context for the things that you're seeing and the great way that he illustrated the point in the book was by coming up with a horrifyingly bad company that will probably happen at some point, unfortunately, that actually involves podcasts. So, Okay. Ooh, that's us. So he was saying that podcasts are actually still 
a relatively good medium or place to be in terms of having actual meaningful discussions and conversations because you actually get the context. We've been talking for Mm -hmm. a while now and you guys can see all of the other episodes that we've made. You have pretty much the full context of what's going on. And they're numbered too, so you know in what order things come. So what he was saying was that if you wanted to create a company that is going to do two podcasts, what has happened to text and video, what you would do is essentially create a platform that will take in a bunch of different podcasts and find all the best or most polarizing clips from all the podcasts, maybe like, you know, five, 10, 20 second clips, and kind of put that together into a kind of like feed or maybe like a morning deep dive or whatnot for each individual user. So then you'd get like 10 seconds of this person talking, 10 seconds of that person talking, 10 seconds of the next person talking. And you just get hot take after hot take, you know, like whatever is most uh, controversial or going to keep you listening more and more. That's very interesting. Yes, you're just getting this like Frankenstein podcast, essentially. That's all happening algorithmically based on whatever it thinks that you want to listen to. Do you know what that reminds me of? Have you ever seen Scooby-Doo 2? Probably. Which one is it? It doesn't really matter. Okay. Uh, there's this one point where the, the, the reporter, uh, she's interviewing them and she keeps taking the clips out of context from her interview and making them look bad. And then at one point when she's being recorded by her cameraman, she's like, oh, I just want to ask you a few questions. And Fred is like, no, I'm not going to answer your questions. You're going to make it seem like I think Poolsville sucks. Because they live in Poolville. And so then the only thing that airs is that clip says that's him saying, I think Poolsville stuck. That's essentially what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> but for podcasts and not news. Yeah, exactly. And that has not happened for podcasts. And I hope it never does because it's terrible. But it has already happened for text, images, and videos. It's kind of happened for thinking of um, on YouTube a whole. There's a whole lot of podcasts that go to podcast places and then also go to YouTube. And a lot of YouTube podcasts, there's bits chopped and spliced out of it, like Joe Rogan or H2H2 or something like that, that are like just a two minute clip of uh, the conversation that you don't really get the context for. Yeah, that's true. That's not great. But uh, that's not on podcast platforms. That's on YouTube. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. I mean, at least on YouTube, you're like going to the videos page so you can kind of see the person's icon and stuff, but it's still not great. Yeah, the the only podcast platforms haven't done that. Yeah, exactly. But that is exactly what's happening. What is happening whenever you go onto one of the social media platforms is that you're just getting a bunch of content completely out of, a, completely stripped of its context, but with a bunch of other random bits of information that they think you'll want to hear and that's exactly what's happening whenever you post is that all the context is gone and it's just being served up like sandwiched between who knows what other content in other people's feeds yeah well good thing i never post uh-huh. fair yeah yeah so that's that's making what you say meaningless i'm okay with it with the point not with although to be honest that one doesn't bother me that much because on social media i don't really say anything that if something's important, I'll tell it to the people who are actually in my life, not the ones who only know me through social media. So I don't really care what my social media image is because if people actually know me in real life, they actually know me. Yeah, it's something like that. I don't feel so much like, again, like it's similar to you that I'm personally being affected by it because anything with a feed is kind of disgusting and I've avoided for a while. For a while. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But it seems like a lot of people do look at the feeds, which is always so weird. Speaking of feeds, I had uh, a little thing that stuck in my mind from a little bit ago that totally had to do with this sort of whole taking your information and sending it to each other kind of thing. It was kind of spooky, to be honest. So it starts with... Um, this necklace I have here, it's a, uh, it's a runic compass, the Vigvisio. It's Icelandic. And basically, I was, I was trying to find, you can see it has like runes on the outside. I was trying to find the meaning of runes on the outside. Uh, because 
I don't read runes. Uh, the the compass itself came from an uh, I think seventeenth century Icelandic book of uh, Nordic symbols. Uh, that this one just said like the where or whoever has this shall not lose their way in bad weather or in storm. But it didn't it didn't have runes in that sense. I'm like, what does it mean? So I was researching that again a while ago, and it started going down the rabbit hole of Nordic paganism, North, so North Germanic paganism, like Odin, Thor, all that kind of shit. And then after that, I noticed whenever, again, this is before I deleted YouTube, um, whenever I would get ads on YouTube, there would be one, this, there's an Estonian clothing company that has um, a lot of like North Germanic pagan inspiration. Like there's like symbols of Odin and stuff uh on their clothing and i get youtube ads for that and at the beginning i was like kind of interested so i wouldn't skip that i would just watch it and be like what are they about what's going on and then after that i noticed that i, I was logging on to facebook on my computer in order to uh talk in my family group chat because i don't scroll facebook because i'm not 80 years old um <laughs> i'm sorry to anyone who scrolls facebook but um <laughs> i was yeah going on uh facebook on the computer to like send something to a family group chat and i noticed the very first ad was for this very same estonian clothing company because i assume because I, it either to do with my google search or because i happened to not skip it on youtube they're like this guy's interested the, the very first ad and i think i've scrolled because i was curious there were a lot more for the specific clothing company and i was like this is a really small company there's no way <laughs> Like, how did they know? There are a number of different ways that that could happen. And you don't even need to visit Facebook or Google or YouTube for the companies to know what you're interested in. Because I think those are two of the biggest advertising platforms out there. And one of the things that a lot of websites do will place a little uh, a Facebook pixel, I think it's called, onto their website that essentially will just kind of uh, track you around and like say, or like report back to Facebook a little bit, like what you're interested in, or like, hey, if you see this guy, give him an ad. One of the things that was kind of interesting, jumping off of that a bit, was that a little while ago I downloaded it, my Facebook information, because that's actually something you can do is just download everything that they have about you or that they know about you. And I was quite pleasantly surprised that they knew very little about me it's because I have very little on there. I don't like like any pages or anything like that. But one of the folders was absolutely massive and that was other companies just logging stuff about me and there were like hundreds of them in there of like companies saying like i did this or usually like i logged in or like i signed up for an account or did something like that and i never sign in with facebook right yeah because i'm not about that because why would you yeah <laughs> but they're still telling facebook about it whoa yeah how do you how do you do that how do you um, in your settings it takes a couple minutes for them to put it together, send it to you to download. I'll leave a link in the show notes for the listeners. Try and find a guide on how to do it. And the reason that I did it was that I was hoping to find something that I actually didn't, uh, which apparently Facebook used to give you a political leaning or ideology. They used to like categorize you and then serve you ads based on that. I didn't see it in my information, so I don't think they do it anymore. But there were a bunch of articles from like 2016, 2017, 18, talking about how you could go in and see what, like if Facebook thinks you're more like left or right. So that was just part of like the categorization they gave you. Like that's not something that people like would write into their profile. Facebook would just take a guess. That's good enough. I'll do this later. I can't be bothered right now. We're in the middle of something. <laughs> yeah, it'll take a little while. But it's definitely that's something that's, interesting mm -hmm. i want to see what the man knows also since we haven't even gotten to point number five what do you say splitting this into two podcasts i i have to agree with that yeah i i think that would be a good idea all right so just to real quick go over today we've been covering how you're losing your free will why social media is really the most finely targeted way to or solution to all the awful shit going on in the world and more specifically online that's making you into an asshole and it's undermining truth 
and it makes what you say meaningless. Those are the first five of Jaron Lanier's 10 reasons why you should delete your social media right now. Uh, and the, the other five will be covered in the following podcast. Yeah, so make sure that you stick around. Tune in in a couple of weeks when that next one comes out because ooh, we got some banger reasons coming along the way. And of course, if in the meantime you want to watch the film, The Social Dilemma, or even read the book and find out the reasons or the arguments for yourself. Here we are putting the end to the podcast.